special Sunday, and we've got missionaries in uh, all the way from the Dominican Republic. If you don't know where that's at, little island south of Florida, out in the Caribbean, beautiful part of the world, but a very impoverished part of the world. And they've been there for a number of years now, and I'm not going to steal their story and let them tell it, but they've been there for a number of years now doing a really, I think, amazing work. And they'll tell you more about it, but in, in summary, they help churches in the United States build churches in the Dominican Republic. It's a pretty cool program that they have, and I hope in the long term that we as a church will get to partner with them. In the short term, my wife and I have already been talking for a number of years about going down there, and I think the reality is now that our son's a little bit older, I think we're to that point where we're going to be taking a journey to the DR to go and, and check out their work and be part of that, and we'll along the way invite some of you to come with us and then see what God does with it. Because the nice thing is with the DR, Chris and I were just talking about it, you can hop on a plane in Minneapolis, stop in Atlanta, and be in the Dominican Republic in just a few hours. So it's, it's a pretty easy trip to get there and back. It's only an hour difference in time zone, and if we decided to go over Christmas, it's about 100 degrees difference in temperature. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's real, real reason for us to want to go. With that, uh, Chris, Chris is an Iron Ranger, so he's grown up in the region. His wife grew up in southern Minnesota, and they've been around for years. They got to know my wife uh, through... Drake, as well as working together at the Science Museum of Iowa uh, a long time ago. We won't tell how long ago that was, but uh, they are here. Their young daughter, Sophia, is in the back somewhere, and their son, Paul, who's three and a half, is playing in the nursery. Let's give them a warm welcome and give them your ear that they might share God's word with us today. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Yeah, go, Chris. Go. Good morning. Dios le bendiga. That's pretty close. Uh, in the Dominican Republic, a traditional greeting amongst uh, Christian brothers and sisters and on Sunday morning is Dios le bendiga, which means God bless you uh, in Spanish. The answer, though, is very, very simple because the answer is amen. So Dios le bendiga. Amen. Perfect. You know Spanish. Excellent. Great job. Well, it is uh, certainly a, a, a privilege and an honor to be here, as, as Pastor Chris mentioned. Uh, uh, we are from... The area I was born and raised in Cloquet, Minnesota, 1988 graduate. That'll tell you a little bit about, about my age. Um, attended uh, UMD for a year and then uh, three years at St. Cloud State University. Um, uh, worked in, in Minneapolis for a while and then moved down to Des Moines, where ironically I had to go to meet my wife, who was also from uh, southern Minnesota, around the New Prague area, and uh, she was attending Drake University and was uh, in the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship with, um, with Kim, and, uh, and that's uh, where they met and uh, developed a, a long-lasting relationship that continues to this day. Uh, it is also a privilege to be back in a place where I can once again refer to soda as pop and, uh, and a, a, a roof as a roof. Um, my, my uh, accent hopefully will be, will be uh, well received here. We get a lot of groups from the East Coast and they wonder where in the world did, did I come from? But now I feel like I'm, like I'm uh, at home. And uh, it is truly a blessing. We are on our way to, uh, to Cloquet then to visit with Grandma and Grandpa who will see baby Sophia for the first time this afternoon. Uh, so we pray for safe journeys for that last hour and a half, the two hour journey um, to, uh, to where I grew up where we'll spend most of the week. Well, before we start today, I wanted to talk, uh, to read a little bit of scripture out of uh, Luke, uh, Luke chapter 5. And in Luke chapter 5, we'll start at, uh, at verse 1. Uh, it says, And so it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Now when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into, uh, into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answers and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. And so, I wonder if they were getting walleyes or muskies or what was coming out of the, the lake there. 
Um, verse 7, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And, si and Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. Okay. Um, Cindy was going to share a little bit uh, about this verse, but she's right now making sure that uh, uh, our daughter is asleep. Uh, maybe she'll be coming in a second. But it was interesting because as we were driving in today, uh, I noticed on the, on the left-hand side of the road, someone was walking along the side of the road with a fishing pole. And boy, how, how, um, how interesting... Uh, to refer to this as, as we, uh, especially in this, this neck of the woods, spend uh, a lot of our lives uh, fishing and doing everything we can to get those fish, how we can also be doing the same thing to reach people for, uh, for Christ Jesus. Well, we, uh, my wife and I have been blessed to be a part of, uh, of Time Ministries, uh, an organization that has a long history in the Dominican Republic. And I'm going to pull this thing out of my pocket and see if we can get it to work. Oh, there we go. Uh, Time Ministries. And Pastor Chris stole my thunder. Those of you that were in the Sunday school class can't answer this, but the first question is, where is the Dominican Republic? It's not in the news a whole lot unless you're talking about baseball, uh, because a lot of our, our current baseball players are coming from from that country. Uh, but the Dominican Republic is located just a two-hour flight from Florida, an uh, island in the, in the Caribbean, a very beautiful island, a very beautiful people, shares uh, the island with Haiti as well. And it, it's a great place for ministry. There's a great need there. It's a safe country to work in. It's easy to get to. And, uh, and so as, as, we, uh, as I share today, I hope that you'll think a little bit about that and also look at the pictures, look at the people in the pictures, and, and, and see who's serving. Um, it's not just men with construction experience. It's not just women with VBS experience. It is a whole range of folks from ages 8 to 80 and everything in between different kinds of groups, men's groups, women's groups, family groups, youth groups. Uh, we have a ministry that is open to all who simply are willing to serve. Uh, Time Ministries has two locations uh, where we do ministry, Monterey, Mexico, where it, the ministry was originally founded in 1968, and in the Dominican Republic, where Cindy and I serve. Uh, in the Dominican Republic, we have a, a team uh, of four uh, missionaries, four missionary families, I should say, uh, myself and Cindy and, and our two kids. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner is uh, our site director, Noe, and his family. He's a, a Dominican national. He's been with the ministry for 20 years, basically since it got started in that location. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, John Carlos and Chris Mary, uh, with their daughter, Jean Mary. John Carlos, Chris Mary, Jean Mary. Uh, we all thought it was a joke when they first said the name, but uh, that's, that's what they've named her. And uh, she is about a month older than our daughter, Sophia, so we've got some best friends forever growing up there. And then in the lower left-hand corner is Doretta Brown. She is the wife of our founder, and they, she celebrated this year 93 years in ministry. She is still up and alert and, and, and working with the ministry and helping out. Her daughter has, uh, has a ministry as, as well, and she, she works with her quite a bit too. Uh, Doretta says that she is going to retire someday, but not until she gets old. Well, <laughs> Uh, at, at 93, I guess she, she still considers herself quite young, although we have heard some, some rumors that maybe she's thinking about slowing down a little bit more. Uh, in fact, it was just last year, um, she started feeling sick and we were all a little bit concerned. It turned out she outlived the battery in her pacemaker and they had to uh, give her a, a recharge and she was up and back and, and ready to go. So we're blessed to have this, this wonderful team of, of missionaries serving uh, with us in, in, the, in the DR. We have all the parts of the body covered, uh, as, as, as Paul refers to. Uh, we each have our own specialties. My main role in the ministry
ministry uh, has been construction and maintenance. So I work with the groups that are, are building the chapels and doing the different uh, construction projects. Also trying to keep the water running and, and the lights functioning and all those other things of the facilities that we host. Uh, my wife Cindy works a lot with the communication and the scheduling of the groups. So she's talking on the phone, helping groups set up their, uh, their ministry uh, and, and their schedule. She also does the site finances for our location. And uh, hopefully she'll be back a little later. She'll talk about the MOPS ministry, the Mothers of Preschool that she does. Um, our other missionaries, um, we have John Carlos. He's in charge of our sports ministry. Uh, his wife helps groups plan ministry with the pastors, VBS programs, and so forth. Uh, Doretta is still our kind of our marketing person. She's always writing letters and meeting people and telling about, uh, telling folks ab about what great things God is doing in in the Dominican Republic. And then uh, Noe, our, our director at that location, and his wife Anjali helping out in the kitchen and the hospitality. So we've got uh, a great team. Uh, to work with down there. Very brief history of time. Our founder, Zerrell and Doretta Brown, came to the Dominican Republic in 1947. Uh, Doretta was from southern Minnesota around St. Charles. Her husband, Zerrell, was from Salem, Oregon. They met at Northwestern, uh, where they were attending college. Uh, and from there, they felt the call, they heard the call to go into missions and they were led to serve in the Dominican Republic. They had two small children at the time. You might be a little hard to see in the picture there, but they had their, uh, I don't know if that was a, uh, can anybody identify that car? I don't know, she said it was a 34 Ford or something like that. And uh, they had an organ, an old pump organ that was strapped to the top of it. They put that on a boat and, and sent it down to the Dominican Republic and they hopped on an airplane with two, uh, with two young children. And they started to work in a, in a country location um, they, they led uh, several folks to, to the Lord. Uh, they had many youth grow up through the church, and then they moved into the main city of Santo Domingo uh, because a lot of those students were moving to attend the university. And uh, after a few years in Santo Domingo, they left the Dominican Republic and it went into Cuba. And things were great there until the, the 50s when Castro came into power. And so at that point, they were led to start serving in, uh, in South Texas and going back and forth across the border doing ministry uh, evangelistic outreaches in Mexico. Uh, they met a young pastor in Monterey, started partnering with him. And in 1968, they formed Time Ministries. They organized Time. It originally stood for Teen Institute for Missionary Evangelism because a lot of the groups coming down were youth groups. But then they started seeing more adult groups, and they had to change the name to The Institute for Missionary Evangelism. And nowadays, we just refer to it generally as Time Ministries. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Zero passed away in 1996. Um, but uh, Doretta has still continued on and, and kept uh, the ministry strong and growing, and it continues to grow each, uh, each and every year. So the goal of Time Ministries is the same goal that every single one of us has, and that is to glorify God. That's number one on any mission statement, on anything that any of us do, regardless of what it is, is to glorify God. Uh, in particular, with Time Ministries, our purpose is to glorify God by leading uh, short-term groups to the mission field, groups that come from churches such as this one to serve for about a week at a time, serving national pastors. And the churches will benefit through these groups, through folks like yourselves, uh, through construction, evangelism, and discipleship. Those are our three main components of the ministry that, that we do, and we'll talk just briefly about, uh, about each one of those. Uh, the construction aspect, we want to provide pastors with some physical need that they may have. Most commonly, it's a building. It's a church. We call them chapels because they're smaller, uh, smaller versions of, uh, of, of churches. Um, they may be meeting under, uh, under a palm tree, or a tarp or something like that. They don't have anything to keep them out of the elements, and so we help provide for that need through the groups. Um, evangelistic outreaches, those churches often want to uh, share the gospel with their communities, but they may not have the resources to do it well, and so the groups will come and help them through things like VBS, 
um, through sports ministry, uh, other types of evangelical outreaches, and, and we'll be talking a little bit more about those. Uh, and then discipleship. Uh, at Time Ministries, we want to really help the nationals become missionaries and become leaders in their churches and, and in their communities and in their families. And so ongoing programs that we have with, with the nationals that we work with, the youth that are part of, of our partner churches, uh, we give them opportunities to serve with us uh, in the hopes that they will catch a fire for missions too. Oftentimes in, in the Dominican Republic, and I'm sure it's this way in other countries, uh, they think of missionaries as the people that come to help them when in fact they are all missionaries and you are all missionaries. You just have a different mission field. And we want to encourage them uh, to learn that process of sharing the gospel uh, as well. So here's an example of, of one of the things that, that we do. We have a, a pastor here uh, who has a need. He has a church. This is his church, uh, a pole and some tin roofs. And this is the second church. The first one was a mango tree that they met under. And this is Pastor Carlos and his, uh, and his wife, Sarah. And they were led to start sharing the gospel in this small rural community called Pika Pika. And they uh, would hold uh, Bible studies, uh, like a men's study and a women's study. But they were really in need of a building where they could, could keep, uh, you know, keep their programs out of the elements. So they got into contact uh, with us at Time Ministries to help provide for that, uh, that need. Uh, this is, is the location where they're at now. Uh, they have three buildings, three of these chapels, one for the sanctuary, one for the kids' activities, uh, one for senior uh, activities, and, and one for a nursery. Uh, so God has really blessed this community. And now, this, this was back in 2010 when we built the very first chapel. And now in, in 2015, last year, uh, they actually planted their own church out of that community. And uh, here's a, a picture of Pastor Carlos and uh, Joni, the man in the, in the blue shirt in the middle there. It's a little hard to see. But he, uh, he, has, um, he was led to the Lord through the original church at Pika Pika. And over the years, has, has become more and more interested in, in leading uh, a group and some Bible studies at this new location. So this is an, an example of what can happen from, from just nothing to the Lord really working uh, in a pastor and getting to the point where they are actually planting their own churches. So the first aspect of, of the ministry is the construction aspect. Um, and so typically that is the construction of these buildings, these chapels which start with a foundation. Uh, the groups will actually do this, mixing cement by hand on the ground, no cement trucks uh, or anything like that, uh, like that here. Uh, and then they will build the pieces for this chapel at our headquarters in, in the Dominican Republic. It's all prefabbed uh, panels and so forth, and we have guides and templates that make that construction easy. Uh, our founders did not want this to be something that only construction workers or contractors could do. They wanted everybody to be able to do it, and so the, the process is very easy. We use things as complicated as, as routers and, and chop saws to things as easy as a hammer and nails and paintbrushes. So there's a little bit of something for everybody to do with regard to the construction. And in one week, the group can make all the pieces for this chapel from the foundation uh, to, to the end product. Um, on the last day, we take all those pieces out to the site, and in about five to six hours, we erect the chapel, and it's ready for use almost immediately. And it's a, a great blessing to be able to see a project like this from start to finish. Um, and then handing over the keys to that pastor is really a blessing to be a part of something that they may have dreamed about for, for years, now they have within a week's period of time. Something we would look at as kind of a, a wood shack. Uh, they now have a church and a sanctuary to, uh, to worship him. So that's the construction aspect of, of the ministry. Some of you may say, well, I'm not very good at construction. Well, there are those other parts of it that perhaps you could do, but maybe you're more drawn to ministry, to evangelism, to outreach, to working with a with hundred or more kids running around like a freight chain, as uh, Pastor Chris mentioned. 
And uh, that's where our evangelistic outreach comes from. And these outreaches can take many different forms as well. Uh, it can be through dramas and music. You know, sometimes we'll go to a church uh, or even a park. Believe it or not, you can go to a public park there, set up some speakers, share the gospel, and, and nobody calls the police or asks for your permit or, or chases you away. Um, it's all, always very, very well received. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, we, we can do some park ministry, um, introducing the, the locals and then getting them connected to a church nearby that, that we know of so that after we leave, after the groups leave, there is still someone there working with them and funneling, funneling them into a, to a local church. Uh, sports ministry is a program that's become very, very popular. Uh, a third of the baseball players uh, are coming out of the Dominican Republic. And so that's one place to get them. Basketball is becoming a more popular sport. Volleyball uh, for the ladies. Uh, they don't really do ladies basketball down there. Um, so they will traditionally do, do a, a volleyball ministry. But typically the way that works is we will show up at a location where, where folks are, are playing basketball or, or baseball or something. And we will start doing some drills with them. And then we'll, we'll take a moment to share some testimonies and give a gospel message. And it's really a, a great way to reach folks that may not just walk in into a church off the street. It's a good way of, of getting out to them and sharing the gospel in an environment where they feel safe and, and that they're used to. And we have stories of youth uh, many years ago that started participating in, uh, in basketball programs that then went through a seminary program that our, our partner church offers and now have become pastors of churches. And so it really is an effective way of reaching folks for Christ uh, through sports. And many of you uh, are probably familiar with things like, like uh, Upward Sports and, uh, and many other programs that are doing this nationwide here as well. Uh, VBS is another very, very popular program down there. Uh, most of those churches have lots and lots of kids, and there's lots of kids in those communities. And when a bunch of Americans show up, first they, they just come because they want to know what in the world is going on. But then we have an opportunity to share Christ with them and start at a very young age, get them connected to their local church, help support that church and their staff in running these, these VBS programs with resources that they may not be able to, uh, to afford or to do on their own. Uh, you may have a very, very small church with perhaps the pastor and his wife, uh, and then you've got 300 kids that want to participate in a VBS program. They need help with that, and that's where, uh, where you guys come in. So the construction, that's the construction, the evangelism uh, portion of it, and then finally the, the discipleship aspect. As I mentioned, this is something that, that uh, most of the groups don't see because you're only there for a week, but the ongoing relationships that we have with the Dominican youth that, that we work with, um, they are coming up through the ministry, helping us run the program, working as translators, and they are getting a long-term vision for missions as well. Um, in this picture on, on the right-hand side, the kid in the baseball cap, that's John Carlos. As I mentioned, he's in charge of our sports ministry program. He is a missionary. Uh, he started out as just a volunteer with Time Ministries. Uh, helping with the groups. Eventually, he became a paid staff member. Uh, he went through the Bible Institute training program and now is a full-time missionary with us, a faith-based supported missionary, just like, just like Cindy and I, um, and, and working with his, his wife and their son. So you can see how, how that, that long-term discipleship program can, uh, can affect the youth. So those were the ways that we impact the local church, the national church as we call it. But the purpose of time is to also benefit you, the groups, the short-termers that come down and help with the ministry. Um, I don't think I skipped ahead there. Did I miss a slide? No reset. Um, that was a picture of... Uh, of one of the, uh, the teenagers from a group that came down from Florida. His name was Carlos. And he came down uh, a few years ago, 
he came down with his dad, and he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder, and he would admit that his dad dragged him down on, on this missions trip to serve. And the thing was, his dad was, uh, was Puerto Rican, and so Carlos was very fluent, his son was very fluent in Spanish, but real hesitant to, to use it. In, in America, you'll sometimes find this, um, that um, Hispanic and, and, and Latino youth, uh, even though they can speak the language because their parents speak it, they don't want to do it, especially in public, because it, there's a stigma associated to it, or they feel like they'll be stereotyped, so they don't use that, that language ability that they have, and they don't realize how how useful it will be in the future. So at any rate, Carlos came down, and, uh, and we, he was part of a, a VBS program that we did in a, in a small community. And he, he really felt, felt led to continue that. So the next year, the following year, he came down again, this time without his father. Um, his father uh, wasn't able to come, and so he was willing to come down and we went to the same village and did a VBS program. All the, the youth that he'd met there before, they were so happy to see him again. And he was helping out in all the programs. And at the end, it came time to give the gospel message. And the pastor, the local pastor, wasn't there yet. And so their team leader said, uh, Carlos, we need someone to give, the, to give the gospel message. And the pastor's not here yet. Can you do it? And he said, I've never done that. What am I supposed to do? And there, his, his group there said, oh, you know, you just cover these, you know, these, these three basic things. And Carlos got up in front of those kids, shared the gospel, and gave the gospel message. And we were talking with his father later, and he, he said it was just amazing to see the change in his son and how he's become much more engaged in the local church, in their youth programs, and leading other youth to Christ and serving. And so it's a testament to the, the work that time does. And one of the reasons it's such a blessing to be a part of is that it's just not solely focused on the national church. The purpose is also to help, to help groups uh, have a new experience and a new vision, a new fire for serving the Lord. And even if it's not overseas, right here in your own home church, in your own community, in your workplace, in your families. Uh, it's, it's odd that people are willing to spend uh, you know, thousands of dollars when you factor in all the costs of, of taking a mission trip and doing a project to go someplace where you don't know the language, you don't know the people, you don't know the culture, you don't know the food, and you're willing to share Jesus. And then we come back, and I'm guilty of it as much as anyone else. Then we come back, and what do we do? We're sometimes afraid of what people will think if we start talking about Jesus to them in our own families, where we are most comfortable, where we do know everybody. So we hope as a part of this mission uh, in this ministry that that will affect, uh, affect the American groups too. We also hope that people will be able to, to uh, deepen their relationships with each other. Uh, we often have family groups come down, and sometimes this is the only period for, for seven days where a family will eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner together every day of that week and serve with each other and work with each other. And it's amazing to see relationships change. Uh, we had one gentleman one time who was, uh, uh, worked in business. He did a lot of traveling, was away from home a lot of the time. And he had said that he really needed to rearrange his priorities and, and focus on his family. Uh, another situation, uh, a daughter, teenage daughter in one of the families, uh, you know, said, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that, that my parents were this cool that, um, and, and that I've been, you know, I, I've been very cynical and I haven't had a good attitude and I really need to change that um, because we have a bigger purpose here and that is to serve the Lord. So uh, the ministry, as much as it is for the nationals, it's as much for you. The comment that we always hear from, from folks that come down, they say, we went down there to serve and to bless others, but we were actually the ones that were blessed. It changes our whole outlook on life when we're serving with others. And so this now, I think Cindy is, is here, um, can talk a little bit about the MOPS program that uh, has been a blessing for her and also a, a blessing for the, um, the folks that she works with. Um, yes, one of the things that God laid on our hearts as we were going through training 
is um, to have children. Um, we were married 14 years before Paul was born, and we just um, got involved with our lives, um, both of our careers, and knew um, it was a calling. And maybe we were just waiting for that calling as much as God gave us the call to, to missions. And so when God called us to have children and gave us that, um, that heart for it, we, um, we were in training, getting ready to go down. Um, and while we were down in the DR and thinking, wow, we're about to have a child, um, we're out of our country, we're not living in our own home country, we um, don't have any family around. Um, we're just learning the language and going, wow, how do you do this? How do you raise a family? How do you, you know, get involved? How do you, how does this work? And so I knew of MOPS, and MOPS stands for Mothers of Preschoolers. And MOPS International is here in, in America, but they have expanded to various countries around the world. And when I went to their website and saw there wasn't a group in the Dominican Republic, I looked for that first. I'm like, okay, I remember MOPS in the States. Maybe they have it here in the DR. And that didn't happen. And I was reading a book at the time um, about young mothers. Kind of the, um, it was a conversation between a mentor and her mentee. And um, it was a book by Sally Clarkson and Sally, um, Sarah Sally Clarkson and Sarah May, and it was that conversation, and they said, well, if you want something to get started, typically you have to start it. If you're looking for it, you may have to start it. And I'm like, ah, okay. So I started asking some mothers and saying, you know, is there such a group? Does that exist in the DR? And they said, no, we don't have it. You know, um, we don't have anything really, you know, we kind of talk to our sisters or our moms or I'm like, well, my sister's not here. She would be a phone call away. My mom isn't here. I'm like, oh, okay. So I said, well, would you be interested in a group? Would you be interested in having a mother's group that we could talk about, um, read some scripture, pray for each other, talk about some of the challenges we're having? And they said, yeah, we'd be very interested in it. And so we started... Um, and this February, we'll be celebrating our third anniversary. And we've grown from as small of a group as five or six. And some meetings this past year, we've had almost 18 to 20. And so it's been growing. And that also means that the young families in the church are growing. But they're also sharing it with others. And so this is um, from our anniversary. Uh, we started in February. And so we celebrate on Valentine's Day as our um, anniversary for each MOPS year. And one of, the, um, comp one of the components that um, I love about MOPS is the leadership training. And that's one of the things that we love about um, being missionaries is that it's, it's not about us. We, and, it, and that is the vision of time, that we come alongside the national church to help them, to equip them, and then they can flourish. And that's the same thing with moms. We want to come alongside them so that they can have this and flourish and be able to serve a population that's really growing and help them to continue. And so a key thing that I loved about Mops International is a leadership training. And so um, this is a picture of our Sunday group. We had probably about five or six meetings on Sunday. And that has been a challenge lately as I'm praying for a leadership team for our Sunday meetings. And we don't have that yet. So I'm really praying that we may have that because for our Friday meetings, we have been blessed with a great leadership team. And we have a each of them take a role. And this past year, they've each been leading a chapter. Um, we meet and we go through a chapter in a book and then um, pray for each other and then um, have some fellowship. And then also the children have daycare. And so there's someone to watch the children. And that's one of the key, key parts of it so that the mothers can really decompress and be able to have time um, alone and 
fellowship time, fellowship with Christ and fellowship with one another. And so with our leadership team, we have a wonderful young, um, young woman. Um, she does, doesn't have children yet, but is hopefully in the next few years. But they, um, she's been leading that and being able to find young girls that help take care of the kids for us. Because the whole program is about children in the sense that we really pray that God will equip the mothers to share Christ with them, that they can share Christ with their children and create strong families and to create um, a love for Christ within and create that fire within their children and that that will grow. And so with the leadership team, they just had a meeting on Friday. And so they're continuing it, even though I'm so blessed that I'm here and I can share about that and they can continue and they can continue doing it on their own. And so it's such a blessing to me to see that and see the leadership growing. And we hope that as we are there, that the leadership may continue to grow. And in various forms, that leadership and the ministry grows um, beyond us. That God is growing and God is building up those leaders. Thank you. So as we... Uh Kind of wrap up our, our, our presentation here. We, um, we look back to, to the scripture that we started out with in, in Luke 5. And, uh, and seeing the, the many different places where we can be with regard to this. Um, we can be on the shore listening to Jesus. Um, we could also get in the boats and listen to what he says when... Uh, when we say, because you said so, okay, here I am, send me. I can't do this on my own. I wouldn't think about doing this on my own, but I'll trust you. And we'll get into the boat and we'll push out and we'll see what God has in store. Um, our founder, Doretta, again, 93 years old, has said that uh, her decision to, to become a missionary back in the, uh, in the 40s. Um, you know, never once has she felt, uh, and, and by the way, I should mention, she said that she's never been at 100% support either, um, but she has never gone without. Uh, she's never felt like there was a time that she's really been in need and God hasn't provided what her need was. And so when, when God calls, the simplest thing to do is to just say yes. Um, although not many of us, including ourselves, would always say that we did say yes right away. Sometimes it takes some extenuating circumstances uh, for God to use you um, and to take you somewhere that you maybe would not go on, uh, on your own. So we want to thank you for, for the time to uh, allow us to share about time, taking the time to share about time. And we encourage you to think about putting yourselves in, in these shoes with these groups. Uh, I encourage the Sunday school class, you may think, think of yourselves as, uh, as a small church uh, from a small town. Uh, even though our, our home church is in Des Moines, Iowa, it's a relatively small church, really not, not uh, much bigger than this at all. Um, but they sent down a team three years in a row. And so the first thing that, that you have to sense is God's leading you to, to say yes He's calling us to serve, and he will take care of the rest. Don't worry about the funding, the money, the travel, all those things. You know, first seek the kingdom of God, and he will take care of the rest. Uh, we have a little display table out, out here we'll, where we'll be afterwards. We have some, some postcards and some information. Uh, we have an internship program for, for youth that are one year out of high school, and we'll share some of those materials with, with Pastor Kevin. Um, because in the summer season, we need help. Uh, we need some folks to come down, traditionally college-age students, to come down and help us with the, uh, the multitude of the groups uh, that are serving with. And again, that gives them a discipleship opportunity to learn about, uh, about serving Christ and where God would, would have, them, have them serve. So again, thank you very much for listening to us today. We'll be out there answering any questions you may have, and we look forward to seeing you in the Dominican Republic in the future. God bless.
We'll pray for them here in just a second, but just want to, after uh, the service, they will be in the lobby for a little bit, and you can follow up with them, and they've got their cards and all sorts of other stuff. But if you would like to join us, we have space reserved over at the Pine Inn for lunch today. Uh, They will be going, uh, the missions committee, myself and family will be going, and all of the rest of you, till the room is full at least, are invited to join us at the Pine Inn for lunch uh, following worship today. So uh, you are invited, if I didn't say it earlier. Come join us, okay? Let's, uh, let's say a prayer for them. The other thing I'll point out is um, we, we, as a missions committee, are paying them to be here today, but they are raising support, and they would love to have your support if you'd like to support them one time or in an ongoing way. All that information is out there. Chris and Cindy have cards. I have one on my fridge that's, well, we just, they gave us a new one yesterday. We, we've been keeping their old one on our fridge for a number of years, um, but we have their new one now, and they, uh, they, they are worthy of your support. This is a fantastic ministry, so you can give to them directly or give to the missions committee, and we will make sure it gets to them as well. So uh, thank you for listening today, and let's, let's just offer a prayer for them and their ministry and their travels here. Let's pray. Father God, you are good, and... You are in all the works that we do, but we see your work so much here in this ministry through time ministry that Chris and Cindy and family are involved in. And just pray, God, that, uh, that the fruit would continue to be tremendous, that the blessing uh, would be such that as these chapels are built and as churches grow and as the gospel is spread in the DR, that it would be clear that only through you was that possible. God, uh, as you have maybe laid on our hearts today, uh, challenge us to step out in faith, to grow in faith, to to be bold in our faith, and to uh, go and serve, uh, to go as you have instructed us so clearly in Scripture, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. We we need to make it here in Aiken, uh, but in other places in the world as well, Lord. So as you lead, uh, may we follow in that end. God, keep them safe in their travels. May they enjoy this time away from their new home in the DR here in their old home in Minnesota. May they enjoy time with grandparents the rest of this week. And then as they continue to travel here in the U.S., uh, just bless them with safe travels and and children that are doing well. And then when they return uh, here in a few weeks to the DR, God, may their work just be amazingly fruitful. And may their time uh, just be blessed. And, And may you send the groups and people that they need to accomplish your work there. You are good, God, and you are in all things, and we thank you and we praise you for that work. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all very much. Chris and Cindy Anderson, you can meet them out in the lobby. Go and serve your king. Amen.